Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 794. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 14th, 2023. All right, people out there in the world sitting in front of their computers, iPhones, iPods, whatever you listen to us or watch us with, you're there. Oh, that's a stupid start. Three, two, one. All right, welcome <clears throat> to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us via the magic of internet. You're either listening to us in audio or watching us on YouTube or Facebook, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, before we get too far into the program, I want to remind you to subscribe to the show. We, the viewership has increased dramatically the last couple of months. We really appreciate that. And we want you to be sure that you get instant notifications whenever there's a new episode. So you do that by clicking on that little subscribe rectangle in red. A bell pops up. You click the bell and you will be instantly notified. And I mean instantly, like within moments of when I publish a new uh, episode. And you can watch us then. It's a lot of fun. Uh, like the episode. Share the episode. And go to the comment section. The comments are alive and uh, really taken off again the last couple months. We read them all. We respond to many. And that's just where the show continues. Never really stops. George, how are you doing this week? Well, I'm covering from a very bad head cold. Uh, flu like But uh, I'm alive today. That's more than I felt on Thursday morning of last week when I couldn't even move. I was so sick. Yeah, but here, you, there you go. A <laughs> little bit uncomfortable. Uh, every once in a while, people go, "Why does George's uh, picture look fuzzy?" Well, we record this from two different locations, and for some reason, Lakanto, uh, Florida, doesn't have always the greatest internet. Like in the mornings, we recorded, so the image that's pushed to me from George's uh, setup is sometimes pixelated. It is what it is. Uh, I'm just recording off my webcam here. I'm not trying to be unfair to George. Uh, I could, I would gladly give him all the software and he could click the record button and do all the editing, but it is what it is. As long as his voice is good, as long as the topics are fresh, we are good to go. George, let's move on here to the news. First news story happens to be the Episcopal Church. The House of Bishops are having a little winter conference. And uh, being five years behind the times, they decided to release a statement that is easily five years behind the times. Let's talk about uh, the House of Bishops and the Episcopal Church and their idea of transgender phobia. Yep, the House of Bishops has two meetings each year. Uh, one in the spring they call a retreat, which is closed to visitors, and one in the fall, which is their formal meeting. And this year they issued a statement at the close of their meeting, and it uh, highlights some of the things they discussed. And the meeting, the, the statement was interesting in what it said and what it didn't say. There was no statement of wild approval for the Church of England's vote on same-sex blessings. So you would have thought, I would have thought that if uh, Justin Welby could uh, count on anybody to give him an attaboy, it would have been the Episcopal Church. Ha, huh, they didn't. Instead, they elected a new uh, bishop for the armed forces, a uh, retired Marine major, a woman, be the first woman in this position. And then they uh, gave uh, uh, some words uh, about Frank Griswold, uh, the late presiding bishop, and then they revisited the issue of transgenderism. At the 2022 uh, General Convention in Baltimore, the crazies ran the show there. They had an abbreviated convention, and so the committees basically decided who, what issues would come before and which would just be passed without votes and this and that. And there were several very controversial as resolutions that came up that were just passed without any debate or discussion. Um, one of them was stopped, was one on uh, uh, condemning abortion. Uh, pregnancy centers, yeah. Pregnancy centers, yeah. anti-abortion centers. That was stopped. But one on transgenderism was approved. And the way it was worded, it basically said that you cannot or should not interfere with a child's right to decide their gender. So in essence, the Episcopal Church became 
you know, the castration church that, you know, a five-year-old can be, I'm going to be a boy today, I want to be a girl tomorrow, and on Thursday I'll be a camel and then a bunny rabbit and then a mermaid. And we should not have state laws that interfere with a child's decision to choose. Now that, it wasn't just we should be nice to transgender people. In other words, it wasn't a statement of affirming their civil rights as adults to do, if, 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 uh, What's his name? Bruce Jenner wants to become Caitlyn Jenner. Hey, man, that's fine with him. As long as he has the money to ha to do the surgery himself. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But if a uh, 12-year-old uh, girl with autism uh, who is being led by TikTok to question her gender goes and tells the nurse at school and the nurse refers her to a doctor and it's all hidden from the parents, mm -hmm. that stuff's wrong i believe no it is and you i can when my kids were you know in middle school and high school i couldn't give them a benadryl to take during class mm -hmm. i had to contact the school nurse i had to give them four or five forms of id that i was actually the father i had to you know fill out these forms saying please let my child have a benadryl at noon with their meal so that they can make it through the day without the pollen destroying them you so, <laughs> parents had rights. Schools had rights. Well, Protect the children. So, General Convention comes up with some crazy statement that lets children be the, their own masters in this area. Well, the Episcopal, the Episcopal Church was always late to the party on social issues, and it was late to this one. There are 22 states that are in various degrees banning uh children from uh, making these decisions or banning gender reassignment surgeries for people under 18, all of this stuff. And in fact, on the same day, the Episcopal bishops uh, reaffirmed their support for transgenderism. Uh, I think it was Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi passed laws further restricting uh, children uh, without parental support or even with parental support receiving body altering surgery so some nuts in the house of bishops decided it's more important to reaffirm the episcopal churches being the church of what's happening now on transgenderism than it is to affirm the anglican uh shattering efforts of justin welby well the the final statement though is a little bit nuanced instead of going all cr bat crazy that something crazy <laughs> yeah. as they would as they did at general convention the bishops just reaffirmed the civil rights of gender transgender people they left they didn't undo what they did but they didn't restate and reaffirm everything that they did so something tells me slowly but surely some of the adults are taking charge again in these institutions after having years of just the the, the children running the the kindergarten but to, to me, that it's even a question of mutila of gender mutilation, of you know, for years the Episcopal Church campaigned against Arab countries that uh, uh, permitted female genital uh, mutilation, cir mm -hmm. circumcision, saying it was you know offensive against women and this and that, and now we we our Episcopal Church is advocating a procedure that is a hundred times more horrific. Oh well, yeah, where you know where to start with this? Um, thankfully, the European nations—Switzerland, Finland, France, Italy, Spain—you yeah, know, if you just go through most of the European uh, countries are saying stop. We really, when we looked at the data, ninety percent of people who feel transgendered confusion before in their adolescence and before 18 revert back to their biological sex that's that's 90 percent so the europeans have learned not to butcher their children they've stopped a line for surgeries and but if you're 18 you can still kid and that whatever okay we, let's go with that but let's stop doing this to the children england has it england still goes for it most of the uk still uh promotes uh uh 
up uh, top and bottom surgery for for children who uh, question their gender flu- uh, identity. Here in America, like you said, states are turn, uh, changing because they're looking at the empirical science. The science, when you do the long-term research, says 90% return to their biological identity. That's huge. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually higher, but um, in that, do we want to let a 12-year-old make a life-changing alteration to their body that really can't be undone? Once you mm-hmm. introduce hormone blockers, once you have that surgery, it is extremely difficult. And there's an interview, a famous interview with the um, the gentleman who had had it reversed uh, two or three times. Uh, he's now in his 70s or uh, 60s or 70s. And he says, "I the surgery never made me a woman. When I reverted back to being a man, I could never become a man again because I've been on uh, estrogens for so long. So I decided to become a female again. It never made me a woman. It just uh, wrecked uh, my body and mm-hmm. that's what we're doing now to the kids it's it's a tragedy that i hope this generation gets rid of very quickly there's no way back george uh, and to me that a church it's one thing to say that an adult you have autonomy and i do not believe that just because of someone is a cross dresser as an adult that bruce jenner should be you know under civil penalty for his actions or choice. I believe his choices are ill-founded. I believe he's suffering from a mental condition. Absolutely. absolutely. But I would not criminalize that medical condition. Mm -hmm. What I would criminalize and what I support are doctors and pharmaceutical companies looking to make money or looking to promote an ideology on the backs of these children who cannot legally make a decision uh, in these matters. Well, we have hundreds of lawyers who watch our show. This is a great opportunity for a class action lawsuit. Mm. I, I always refer to the uh, tr- uh, D-Trans group on Reddit, which is now up to like 62,000 uh, uh, kids who regret their decision to transform their bodies medically, socially, or chemically. And you can go in there, put an ad that you're going to help them sue their doctor, uh, the Department of Education, or in their school to help get their bodies back, to help Mm -hmm. get their souls back. Because one thing you and I haven't mentioned yet, this is demonic. You know, it's one thing for Satan to convince you that he does not exist. Bravo, Satan. It's another to convince you that you are not who you feel you are, to cause that chaos and that confusion to where you question your sexuality, to where you question your body identity. That's Satan's greatest uh, work. Yeah. You know? See, God made men and women in his image. And the demons hate that. They hate humanity. They hate uh, us. And they seek to destroy us by having us hate what God created, which is ourselves. Hmm. It is just... As you say, Kevin, it is black letter, demonic, evil. And my church leaders feel that uh, uh, it's it's a vote getter, I guess. I don't know. Well, it's but just silly. you and I always talk about the pendulum. The pendulum swings both ways, sometimes with equal force. Sometimes you go conservative wild probably a little too far here's better but you, you made it here sometimes you go liberal Ooh, oh too far way too far and now it's coming back from that that too far to hopefully we, we we start heading back the other way to where people gather common sense again this wokeism has completely wiped out our common sense because it has brought in the power of cancel common sense people who would normally say no are afraid to raise their hands and say Oh, I don't. Can, can can I question this? Because they're afraid to be questioned. They're afraid to be canceled. They don't want to lose their jobs, their positions in society, their positions in government, their positions uh, in their church. Uh, they, and so we've lost the ability to have reasoned conversations because we're afraid of being canceled. I'm not, you know. And, but uh, 
if for whatever reason, God has given me this ability to uh, have some independent uh, income and not worry about it. But if if my job were on the line and I worked for a, a mega company and I was an executive, I probably wouldn't be doing Anglican Unscripted because I would be afraid to lose my job, George. Mm -hmm. You can't lose your job, can you? No, but I'm not going to be able to go any farther no, you are, in my profession. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a hard topic, and what's this? Oh, and I, I pray that you know, in uh, at least ten or twenty years, we look back and we look with disgust and shame what we did with abortion and what we did with transgendered surgeries. You know, we, the the internet has just caused gender dysphoria gone mad amongst our mm -hmm. kids. And our answer was to, to, to solve it with a scalpel. <sighs> Demonic, George. Let's move on to the news. I have, oh, Princess Meghan the Corrupter. Uh, they, uh, Harry and Meghan have baptized their child. And the controversy is bishop or archbishop? No. The controversy is can you have private baptisms, George? Meghan Markle corrupts everything she touches, it seems, and and the the poor Episcopal Church in Los Angeles is the latest uh, victim of her. Uh, well, I don't know is is now under her spell too. Yes, that's uh, what there was about. a popular news item that uh, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan uh, had their child baptized at the Episcopal Church, and they put out a press release saying the Archbishop of Los Angeles did it. Well, of course, the Archbishop of Los Angeles is the Catholic Archbishop. The Bishop of Los Angeles is the Episcopal Bishop, John Taylor. Uh, John Taylor, uh, and for some of the English newspapers were all excited that this man had been former chief of staff to Richard Nixon and had uh, been a uh, had been on this had run the Nixon Library for Richard Nixon when Nixon was in retirement. Oh well, some people get religion in the funniest ways. Yes, they do. Well. The baby was baptized by the bishop, which is a, a very nice touch. However, it was a private ceremony. And the Episcopal Church, long time ago, put out rules basically saying you cannot have private baptisms because baptism is public initiation into the body of Christ. And you can't do it and say, no, you're not welcome. And so, but I guess Meghan Markle is special. And so the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles bent its rules. Now, if a baby is like born, we've got moments to live. Still you know, born, moments to live. Uh, and and I've, that, I know people who had their, their baby, bat, their infant, close to dying infant, baptized privately because the, the, the priest had to rush to the hospital and do so. Thank God that was uh, available to them. Yeah, and it's... That's one thing. There are exceptions, of course, but this does not fit into the exception rule. Uh, so I don't know. It just makes the the church has rules, and they should have them for both the big people and the little people. Um, because what do I say to the next person? That says, "Well, I'd like to have a private baptism, and I just want to have it for my family. I don't want all these strangers looking at the baby and." Then we'd like to have a little party afterwards, and we don't want to have to pay for everybody. What am I supposed to say? No, you can't do that because it's supposed to be public. Or she says, "Well, why did Megan get to do that?" Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, can and can we do our baptism just with water, no prayer? Yeah, you know, the prayer thing's a little much, you know. Or well, here's my big thing with Harry and Megan. They've done a lot of bridge burning the last three or four months. Maybe it was an open to public baptism and nobody showed you know that that that's well, a a possibility they did they did invite his brother and father mm -hmm. and sp their spouses but they alas could not make it okay all right moving on into the news i hope everybody here got a chance to watch the last episode i did a special anglican unscripted with isabel von sprog sprog spray i'm sorry <laughs> early morning uh and uh um it was a great interview she has been arrested twice for the crime of thought crime or prayer crime uh when she has uh, went into a buffer zone too close to a 
uh, an abortion clinic and silently prayed, prayed, silently prayed, not raising her hand, not anointing oil on, the, on a lamppost, but stood there quietly uh, in contemplation and meditation and prayer. She has been approached by police twice and arrested. The first time a couple officers came over and said, you can't do this. I'm going to have to arrest you. Second time they came over and right on the street questioned her, what are you praying about? And they sent a battalion. There were six officers in a paddy wagon to get her. And now we learn England has passed thought crime legislation, therefore admitting uh, the, the legislation it says, says you are not to do anything that has a form of influence in a buffer zone. George, silent prayer has been legally admitted to have a form of influence. Well, congratulations, sure, <laughs> England, for doing that. But, yo, no, not the thought crime. <sighs> yeah. Parliament uh, even uh, had a, uh, an amendment that would specifically allow a non-threatening, non-adversarial prayer, if you will, mm -hmm. Uh, so that you don't have people hurling curses and invectives yeah, against yeah, people. I, yeah. um, but Parliament voted it down. Now, here's the thing. This is a conservative government. I don't I don't want to get into British the, the nuts and bolts of British domestic politics, but, man, you guys, what you call conservatives are what we call loony left Democrats in the United States. Yeah, that wouldn't even qualify uh, for a Kennedy Democrat. You know, this this is this is left, loony left, in, in the conservatives. Maybe when I'm looking at what a conservative is in Europe, I get it. I'm getting it wrong. Mm. You know, for me, Ronald Reagan is a conservative. I'm from the '80s. Um, uh, certainly, some representatives here in Florida, a DeSantos is a conservative. Um, I don't know. I, I don't get it. So the. The total nonsense that this law says is the criminalizing thoughts in a certain zone or area. Now, of course, Kevin, it raises all the things that you just raised. You know, at what point, you know, how far can prayers go? Do they have a radius? Uh, do they have a shelf life? In other words, can you pray, zoop in, pray quickly, pray quickly, and the prayer will last? So these poor people, you know, the parliament is treating religion like, like witchcraft. Like these are spells or something, and the spell and the witch finder general is going to go and hunt down Elizabeth von Spruce, Isabel von Spruce, every time she prays that the Lord's will be done for these poor women and their infants that they're carrying in utero. Yeah. It's, I don't want to sound all melodramatic and everything, but this really does speak that a decline of Anglo American civilization, Western civilization. Well, this is the stuff that we fought the Nazis to prevent. This is the stuff that, you know, we fought, you know, the forces of, uh, of uh, darkness all these years. And now our own governments are imposing this darkness upon us. Well, here's the, the decline. Uh, Isabel von Spruce should not have been the only person or uh, two people uh, arrested. In England, uh, Birmingham, uh, where the author of um, 1984, uh, George L. Orwell, lived, for the love of God, millions of people should be there protesting and being arrested. Mm -hmm. The Church of England, the, the House of Bishops, the House of the Synod should be there being arrested, being martyrs over this. We will not have any location on the shores of the UK where we cannot silently prayer. How dare you? This is, I, my anger in this is just, you know, distorted because you know, you've lost the English people and you've lost the English church. And thank you, Isabel uh, uh, von Spruce for your, your fidelity and loyalty to the God I love and trust. Thank you. Uh, if the ACNA and GAFCON want to create a little certificate or hero uh, um, wall or something like that and send her something, thanking her for being uh, uh, somebody who's standing firm for the faith in England, 
uh, right now, one person deserves it. So. And she's a Roman Catholic, and she hasn't even found the backing of her own hierarchy in England. Mm. Um, it's not just the Church of England who's absent without leave. No. It's the Catholic bishops who are absent without leave in England on this issue also. The other person she was arrested was a Catholic priest, Sean Goff, I think his name that's, is. I think that's how you pronounce um, it. <clears throat> but he... Uh, so it's not that there's nobody out there, but it, it's like the Episcopal... It's, it, it's analogous to the Episcopal Church is getting worked up on transgenderism. It's not the issue that people wake up worrying about in the morning. Free speech, free thought, being able to talk to your colleagues at work without being threatened with being fired. There was a little uh, uh, viral uh, moment on uh, Twitter I saw the other day where this man was asking a group, a group of gr girl college students, women in their 20s, to define what a woman was. And... All, none of these girls were willing to do so, not because they were ignorant, not because they weren't biologists, but because of the repercussions of their saying forbidden speech, forbidden according to a very tiny sect of cultists of uh, who groomers in, in and cult world. yeah cultists absolutely yeah. So we've we've reached such low depths that uh, well. Maybe now the, the we can start climbing out. Little pendulum swing, I hope. Well, hold on. There's something that keeps, like, I don't know the education and the uh, acumen level politically of the people who watch this program, but some of you are from England, and England, uh, the UK, has a king. His name is King Charles. There is something that keeps him up at night. It's not free speech. It's not... Uh, the stuff happening down on uh, the downtown of Birmingham. It's not uh, legal immigration. Uh, I could go through the list of things that the king is not worried about. But, George, what is he worried about? Climate change. No. Sperm oil. Keeps him oh. up at night. <laughs> oh, well, you know, Charles is a greeny weenie. We've always known that. And he, like Greta Thunberg, has had to erase a few tweets saying in five years we'll all be dead because the ice caps will have melted and the polar bears will have drowned. Well, King Charles is going to have a vegan coronation. What do I mean by that? I'm not talking about what they're going to serve at lunch afterwards, but rather traditionally the oil used to, announce, to anoint a new king was made was sperm whale oil and also civet oil. And this oil is now going to be olive oil. And so they asked the Anglican bishop in Jerusalem, who had the, Angl the Greek patriarch of Jerusalem join him, bless some olive oil from the Mount of Olives, which has been flown back to, his, to England so that Charles can have olive oil smeared on his forehead instead of whale oil, sperm oil, uh, so as to save the planet. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Hope that works for you, Charles. <clears throat> Law of long live the king. All right, let's move on to some more news, George. This is uh, kind of, it's hopefully a completion to like a three-year story. Um, we're talking about Mark, Mark Rivera, uh, Bishop Rook, the Diocese of the Upper Midwest, um, which if you watch the show for any time, you know what's happened there. Uh, Mark Rivera was a layperson in the diocese who happened to be a groomer and a rapist and chaos ensued and the church had to, to deal with its first groomer and, and rapist according to rules that it had set up to to work in this type of situation the legal system got involved and that worked and mark rivera this week was sentenced to 15 years and as chaotic as it looked george the system worked i think oh. that's a fair estimation kevin yeah. There have been complaints all along that things were not done as quickly or as uh, properly as they should have been done. Mm -hmm. And those have been borne out to be true, that there were some people lower down in the chain who thought they could resolve this at a pastoral level, when, of course, it's a criminal offense. Sure. But at the end of the day, the system worked. Uh, the legal system and the church ecclesial system. Um well, what I think it... w yeah, w one of the problems we have is there's the, that type of uh, individual or group 
that wants instant justice. You know, there, there's that desire, especially in, in the year 2022, 2021, 2023 here, where we have determined guilt and we want justice. We want to break the person out of the jail and put up a, a, a quick gallows and hang them. Damn be the system. Mm-hmm. And I kind of see that here. I don't want to name the organization that was doing that because I'll get sued. But, you know, I, I, I want to be assure you, as you know, certainly the people who, who are viewers from the church, the system can work, but the system always takes time. And there's always pain because a brother in Christ committed a horrible crime. And we have a, a system set of uh, rules that we follow in, in Scripture and through the legal system to take care of this. And yeah, it takes time. It's hard. And there are always going to be these sorts of problems because people are fallen and the people are evil. And that includes people in the church. Yeah. We had a case in the Church of England just this past week where a woman priest uh, was uh, suspended from ministry for life for failing to report on a child molester who happened to be her husband. This man had been molesting little girls for about over 10, 15 years, and the wife knew about it, and she was a minister. She did nothing about it. He's been jailed, and now the church has gotten its act together and kicked her out of the ministry, um, as it should have. Uh, this was the, you know, she knew what the rules were, and just because that's your husband, unless he made his confession to you in a sacramental manner, you still have to report on him. Uh, and not allow him to work in your parish helping out with the kids when you know he's a child molester. Now, I'm sure there are all sorts of dynamics as this woman's denial about her husband and this and that. But still, this is not, this is a human predicament. The, the, the snake is going to be in the garden mm -hmm. wherever that we plant that garden. And we must always be watchful and alert for the e evil creeping in. Well, and I always think there's people outside who think that everything is a conspiracy or a, co or a cover up. Now, uh, I hang mm -hmm. out with liberals who think everything's a conspiracy. I think hang out with conservatives who think everything's a conspiracy, and that there's gonna, that, that the first job of the church is to cover it up. And here, to the credit of the ACE, &E, they, they went through uh, the expensive. Uh, decision to bring in a third party to, to do an investigation um, and put everything on paper. And you and I both read the report and it basically said there's no cover up here. There's a few wrinkles. You know, it, 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 it just, there is, I think there's admittance there, there is no perfect system in, all, in taking care of something like this. And uh, there are a few things that the ACNA and the upper Midwest should do better in the future. But there was no cover-up. Nobody was deleting emails. Nobody was uh, trying to cover this up. And you know, to the credit, you know, I, um, it's good to see that. And, and then it's good to see justice. But I want to let you get people know that the Mark Rivera story is not over for the diocese of the Upper Midwest because there still needs to be a, a, a time, maybe decades, of healing in this. Mm -hmm. Something evil has happened. And um, as a diocese and as a church, you're going to be licking your wounds and, and praying that uh, uh, God can redeem this for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, so. But I, I also want to uphold the fact that the Upper Midwest and the ACNA overseers did this with honesty. Mm -hmm. There was no attempt to obfuscate, no attempt to shift blame, no attempt to cover up. And let's just contrast that with what Lambeth Palace just did uh, on the uh, same general issue. <laughs> okay. The new we issue? reported. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We reported about, uh, I made a mistake. Uh, I said it's the former Bishop of Manchester. Of course, it was the former Bishop of Birmingham. Yes. He was brought on board to uh, uh, be the new Bishop to the Archbishops of Canterbury, New York. And traditionally, that job also included safeguarding for the archbishop's offices. This was a guy who looked into child abuse and bullying and all this and that claims. Well, Bishop Urquhart, the new bishop to the archbishops, when he was bishop of Birmingham, 
was publicly found on two occasions to have made spectacular failures in safeguarding. He was an example of what you don't do, cover up and failing to investigate and all this and that. Well, when his appointment was announced, the ad victims advocacy groups in England said, hey, wait, 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 wait. The Archbishop's office has gotten reviews saying they're doing a terrible job on safeguarding. Now they've appointed a guy who's a two-time loser to be in charge of this. This doesn't make sense. Well, then the Lambeth Palace put out a press release last week saying, oh, by the way, uh, safeguarding is now no longer the responsibility of the bishop to the archbishops. Uh, it, it's the chief of staff's job. And... I don't, where, I don't know where people got this idea that it would be the archbishop's job. It's not like all of his predecessors had that job, which he did. It's not like the report that we're just responding to assumed that this would be one of his jobs. So in other words, that to save faith in appointing an unqualified person to a post, Lambeth Palace spun the news to tell a lie that we never intended this to be the outcome when... They just got caught with their pants down yet again. No, they're, they're, in fact, they're gaslighting. They're, they're busy, get, get with the program. Of course he wasn't hired for the role of the previous job description. <laughs> Come on. You know, why, why, would, why would you think that he was hired to do you know, this job that, that he was hired to do? Uh, it's just ludicrous. Well, yeah. uh, now we could spend the next five programs doing follow-up responses to the... Uh, L L L L L F living love and faith uh, decisions made by the uh, church synod, and I think we should just cover some of the highlights. The newest province of the Anglican Communion dropped okay dropped a bomb and said this is re abhorrent, redundant. And early on, uh, the head of the ACC and others indicated that the Africans just don't understand. Mm -hmm. Your um, uh, anger towards us is unfounded, and you don't understand Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, South Sudan, Nigeria. If you would understand what we're doing, you would really a approve of this and support it. But I'm reading responses now that clearly clearly state that they understand exactly what this means, and it's abhorrent, George. And the province of Angola and Mozambique, the uh, newest province of the Anglican Communion, put out a statement, and it was a bit of a shocker because it was so clear and firm and straightforward, uh, even translated from the original Portuguese into English. Yeah. It made it quite clear that though England may be the mother church of the Anglican Communion, you're no longer Christians because of what you've done. So... The, the, the Mozambique church, which is probably the poorest church in the world, mm -hmm. Anglican world, is saying, you guys just do not understand the saving grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Egypt put out a similar statement. Um, the, uh, the surprise in Angola and Mozambique was that the acting primate, Carlos Machina, uh, was put into positioned by the South African Archbishop Tabo Makoba. Last week, Tabo Makoba suffered a very big loss when his province refused to go along with his push for gay blessings. Mm -hmm. They refused to do it. And Matsina had been under pressure from uh, Tabo either to keep quiet, say nothing, or go ahead and support whatever was done in London because they're the boss. And instead, the Angolans and Mozambique bishops basically stuck their finger in the eye of Jordan, Justin Welby and Archbishop of Cape Town. So we've really had a shift. This, has, this move by England has proven disastrous for England's allies in the Anglican Communion. Nobody, you know, just as the general, just as the bishops of the Episcopal Church skipped an opportunity to pat them on the back, Nobody's jumping onto their side. And, you know, we've got the remainder of the Africans are all lining up squarely against. And we even in England are starting to see defections from the House of Bishops ranks. Uh, Jonathan Gibbs, 
the Bishop of uh, Rochester in England gave a presidential address. And that's long and you have to read it through and it's nuanced. But essentially what he's saying is that I had my arm twisted to do this and I wish I hadn't voted the way I did. And I don't know if I can support it if it should come to pass. Well, so. in this, I see the biggest news. And we haven't really publicized it yet, but GAFCON and the Global South says they're talking together. Mm -hmm. We're talking together. We're going to meet together. We'll let you know. Oh, what? <laughs> oh, wait. What? Oh, I need more than that. Okay, that what, what was the, what was that? That's what that's one sentence. I yeah, I need more, really. And so uh, that's the biggest news here is um, just as what um, uh, codified the evangelicals to get together and work together uh, in the Church of England uh, after what Justin Welby did, the entire you know movement of the global south and gafcon is is going to get together and talk and and they have the power and the fortitude and the and hopefully the desire to set forth a new leadership role in the anglican communion and what an opportunity uh, the church of england has given them uh the church of england says we don't want the role justin welby has admitted um to such that it's just too much for one uh, primate to do and the archbishop job and his and working as the archbishop of, of the church of england just isn't working really well you know this is all and so what an opportunity to recast what the anglican communion looks like in the next decade in the next 20 years in the next generation because your, your competition isn't as fierce as it used to be all mainline denominations are starting to fail and they're starting to go woke, and they're starting to to give up on the gospel, and give up on the 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 sole identity of what the church is and should be. It'd be kind of cool if Anglicanism was the one who didn't give up, George. Cool. Well, God hasn't given up on us. No, we no. give up on him. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, okay. Final story. It's drama. Uh, it's kind of it's soap opera level. I don't know if you've ever seen an American soap opera from the eighties, but that has beset the Church of England. Colin Coward put up a post on his blog saying, "I'm upset. I'm so upset. I'm going to out some people. I'm going to give you some background. I'm going to give you some story, and you're not going to believe a word of it, George. I believe all of it. What's yeah. the story? Colin Coward, a uh friend of this show meaning he's a personal acquaintance of kevin's and mine sure, we've yeah. known him for many years many we years. disagree with essentially everything he says yeah. but i believe he's a nice fellow i like him he God may hate me, our guts like yeah he may hate our guts i love colin Fal i like Collins. he's a fun guy yeah, he's absolutely. a great uh, he's a wonderful dinner companion great mm -hmm. storyteller raconteur yep. well friend of collins who's a priest in the diocese of southern he's a partnered gay man he had an affair with a parishioner, a man in his 30s. The, the priest's male partner, civil partner, filed a complaint with the Bishop of Southwark saying, "My, your priest, my partner, is committing adultery with this pre parishioner whom he's preparing for baptism, man in his 30s. The priest was in his 60s, the man was in his 30s. So the priest was brought before a tribunal and found guilty of conduct on becoming a member of the clergy for essentially committing adultery and having sex with a uh, person under his pastoral care and has been banned from ministry from life. Well, Colin Coward blew a gasket, absolutely blew a gasket, saying, wait a second. The bishop who passed judgment on this priest, Christopher Chesson, Colin said, is a gay man who engages in the same sorts of activities as the priest he just deposed. And Colin's anger was over the hypocrisy of the bishop acting the same way. <laughs> Hypocritically. <laughs> yes. Hypocritically. Yeah. Now, for conservative, Sam Margrave, friend of the show, member of General Synod, uh, wrote on uh, our uh, comment section, 
I don't get it. I mean, if this were a male-female relationship, the guy would receive the same sentence. And Sam is correct. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to remember the mindset is that fidelity and monogamy are not characteristics of most gay relationships. They're just not uh, baked in the way it is in a male-female relationship. Right. Yeah. Back up a second. I know people in long-term gay relationships and it works um, for them. That is not the norm uh, for gay relationships, statistically. This isn't Kevin being all uh, homophobic. This is just you know statistics we've had for a long time that uh, monogamy is monogamy and fidelity is not common, as you said, and uh, polygamy is desired and uh, fell, um, multiple partners are just part of that expression of how they feel love. Now, yeah. the, our point in raising this isn't to, isn't to attack that or this thing. Nope. It's just to, to just to say that's the reality yes. of the the gay subculture mm -hmm. uh, in England and the United States. Um, and so Colin's basic point is that the bishop is part of this gay subculture, yet he has the temerity to discipline a priest for a lifestyle that he himself is living. And then Colin went on to say that, uh, you know, 20 odd years ago, uh, he had told the Bishop of the Southwark at that time, Tom Butler, that he was in a uh, sexual relationship with another man. And Tom Butler just sort of blinked his eyes and did nothing uh, except when, um, but he would then, Butler would then later uh, discipline Colin for basically being a nuisance and not for what he was doing in his bedroom, but what he was saying. So that the bishops were more likely to silence troublesome priests than they were to hold, uphold the standards that they publicly said they were upholding, which they did not hold. And so for Colin, this is a matter of justice, of the hypocrisy of the bishops. No, I can understand. I understand where Colin's coming from. Sure. Given his worldview and his uh, his understandings, this is hypocritical. But and even Colin but, hold on, even in our worldview, George, this is hypocritical. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not just Colin uh, Coward's view. I view this as hypocritical as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And but it's not just well, a plague on both your houses. You're yes. all bad. <laughs> there, it, but but rather. Yeah. How is the Church of England going to come through this interlude successfully if we have these half things said? In other words, one of the things Colin said is that the former Bishop of Salisbury, uh, Colin shared the fact that when this guy was uh, a rector in London, he had gay blessings at his parish. And when this man became the Bishop of Salisbury, where Colin, Colin had retired, to where Colin had retired, this guy lifted Colin's license to officiate, not because he's gay, but because he told people that the bishop had, when he was a priest, done gay blessings in his parish. Now, this guy was a big outspoken supporter of gay rights in the church. And that. But how do you go forward when you have bishops hiding and lying about who they are, what they believe and what they say, just to toe a line and a line that they don't believe? You're never going to get this resolved to the satisfaction of all if you're going to lead with lies. Absolutely. And thus the the drama, the soap opera that is the Church of England. Um, we could have a channel just do you know, just dedicated to Church of England news. Um, there's many dioceses, there's many churches, there's many uh, flavors of Anglicanism that happen there. Um, if somebody wants to start one up, uh, let us know. I'll point to you uh, because there's just so much that goes on there to a church that had it all that uh, after GAF kind of the global south meets soon may have nothing. So, yeah, see, George, what an interesting week in news, huh? Mm. Yeah, I know. Oh, please, just as viewers, you made it this far. This is where you come through as viewers, pray for these situations. Um, Pray that the Church of England would be led uh, by the Holy Spirit in con into conviction um, for leading uh, so many of their uh, uh, flock astray. And same with the Episcopal Church. Uh, same with all these denominations around the world. 
uh, things are getting back, but I'm starting to see the pendulum swing the other way. It's taken a while, um, and it, it's hard to watch, but I have uh, a 30,000 view, foot view of what's happening here. I don't really over-concentrate on one thing, otherwise I go crazy. To God be the glory in all this. May this show give God the glory. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 794 of Anglican Unscripted.